Alright, so buying a home in 2014. So this, this particular event is catered to people that already have a property and maybe is looking to upgrade or, or downgrade or keep one as a, a rental property. And so, so what is your goal? So this is what I just talked about. So basically, I mean, the first step is you want to know what you want to do. Like, are you wanting to get something smaller? Are you wanting to rent a property? Are you looking to sell the, the two-bedroom condo and, and move up? And then the, the next pretty important thing is the financing for it. So once you kind of have an idea of what you want to do, you want to talk with the lender. We've got Jason Pong here, the Veritas Funding, that you, you can talk to in regards to what you would need to do to qualify. So I mean, maybe maybe you can't qualify right at this moment, but he can at least kind of game plan with you to say, hey, if you do these types of things, you know, in a year or three months from now, you'll be able to, to get a property or to keep the other one as a rental if you're going to do that. So here's some more questions. So what can I qualify for? Do I need to sell my current property first? What do I need to do to achieve my goal? So those are all questions that, that Jason can help you with as far as with, I mean, sometimes you may need to sell the property in order to, to get another property. Um, I was just going to say, just because I do a small group and I know everyone in here, so I know you guys do not have a house, so it would be a first time house. These guys do you have a town home in Lehigh, okay. but they would possibly like to think about renting a nice and a different, just so we know like, the audience that we're talking to. So, no house yet, <laughs> town house in Lehigh. No house yet. Yes. <laughs> So what we do for you, so both Sherilyn, Sherilyn and I, we help determine the current market value of the home. So we, we can put together, find comparables that have sold to kind of give you a good idea of what we think you could get out of the property. We can discuss current uh, properties available and pricing. Uh. We've got home marketing, so our job is to market the home, and negotiate the deal, uh, professional referrals, so we're tapped into a lot of people. So we know a lot of contractors, we know home inspectors, we know lenders, title companies, I mean, you name it, we probably know somebody. Property management. Like Property management, what you've got right here. Keep, like if you're gonna keep a rental, I think a lot of people are concerned with um, you know, I don't really want to be a landlord and have to deal with tenants. So that's kind of why you would hire someone like Jeff to manage that for you, so you don't have to worry about it. You just make the money off of it each month. So. And of course, uh, help protect your assets. So you know, we we can kind of game plan with you as well in a way that, now we're not, obviously we're not attorneys, we're not, we can't give legal advice, but we can at least point you in the right direction of things that you can do to protect yourself. I'm willing to give you legal advice, but if somebody asks me I'll just lie about it. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know about that. <laughs> so this right here, th these are one of our clients, so it's both Sherilyn and I, I's client, if, that, if that's a word, I's client. Do you want me to Yeah, so. Okay. So these are the venues, these are friends of ours, we've known them years. Um, so they own a condo in Orem. They had two kids, it's a tiny condo, they didn't ever intend to be in there that long. But they lived there, I think it was nine years. And they really, really wanted to be able to buy a house and keep that one as a rental. Um, they had talked to a couple of other lenders who told them, oh, well, you're going to have to sell that condo to be able to buy another you know, properties that's going to match your needs. They didn't really want to 
to do that. And so I had been working with Meredith and I said, you know what, I think that maybe you should just check with Jason to be sure that it's really not an option for you. And he was able to help them get into a home and keep that other one as a rental. So it worked out for it. All right, so here, here's this, here's their story. So this is them. So we, we owned a condo in Orem, and we lived in a two-bedroom condo for nine years. Nine years. And uh, just kind of got stuck in between jobs and things, and then when we tried to meet with lenders to buy a house or move up and things, our debt-to-income ratio wasn't, wasn't high enough to be able to buy another property. So it looked like we were going to have to just put the condo up for sale and then rent somewhere indefinitely because the condos just weren't selling. So um, so that was kind of our plan. We were going to put the condo up for sale, see what happened, and um, then rent somewhere else in the meantime until we could sell the condo and be able to purchase something else. Uh, but that's when Sherilyn recommended Jason. We went and met with him, and we were able to qualify for a loan to buy our house um, and keep the condo at the same time, which we originally wanted to keep it as a rental property, and the only reason we thought about selling is just because we had two kids and we're growing out of our space too quickly, so we had to do something. And so thankfully, we were able to get a loan to meet our needs and keep the condo. And now we're just running it out and buy our house without wasting money and time in the meantime renting. All right, so that that's their story. And I actually just talked to them just recently when they did this testimonial video. And they're really excited. They really enjoy having a rental property. Uh, so that's us. That's you know, we're, we're more than happy to answer any questions that you guys might have and point you in the right directions of whatever it is that you guys are interested in. We've got great property management companies on our database, lenders, title companies, so you name it, we're here for you. Um, let's see, I guess just what I would add is that we ourselves, we do have, um, so our first house that we bought was in Provo, it was just a super old house that we bought and we rented out the basement to some super cute girls. One of them was back there. <laughs> and so that worked out perfect, but then we decided to upgrade into a home, and so we ended up building a new house, and Jason helped us be able to qualify for that. And the other one is a rental, so we have that one that we make money off each month, and we're in a new house and buying another one. So yeah, it's great if you know, that's what you want to do, we're here to help. So we'll let, who's going next? So I think, let's have, uh, can you guys go? Yeah. Wouldn't that be all right? So we'll have uh, Janet and Kendrick with North American Title. They're gonna just talk to us briefly about the importance of title insurance and a little bit about what it is. Because whether you're a first time home buyer or you have a property that you bought a couple years ago, you probably forgot most of what you did. And so it's kind of nice to get a little refresher course and, and have these expertise people right here. So I'll turn the time over to them. All right, guys. All right, first and foremost, you, you've been through a closing before, right? At a title company? Yeah. You know what that title company did for you? Uh, <laughs> do you have a guess of what we do? <laughs> Took your money. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody knows. Um, so I just kind of put the paperwork together, got everything uh, in line, and then just got everything signed on both sides. Okay, yeah, that's pretty. That's pretty good. Yeah, that, that's pretty much what you see, right? When you go through the process, that's the part that, that you, as a consumer, actually sees. All right, that's all I have. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, who's been through the process before? What do you remember about the first time? Your closing. Um, I don't remember anything on my closing. <laughs> it was like five minutes, and it was great. <laughs> you like, you like and you're so excited to get into that. It was like an hour of signing papers. It was very long. 
She was thinking about, I can paint this picture here. I was thinking this picture here. Right here, and these pillows would look great right there. It was just same here, same here, same here, same here. Yeah. That's it. Oh, I remember. Yeah. Um, even if it's your second time, I know some of you, you know, it's your first, you're thinking about your first. Chris and I were talking about this. Even if it's your second time, it's probably been three to five years, and you don't really remember what happened because it was, you know, a while ago. Um, and usually the first time, you're a little overwhelmed. It's a little scary. And for us, we find, um, you know, you're going to work with a tile company. You want to make sure it's somebody that will explain it to you. First time home buyers, I try to make sure I go into a little more detail and explain it to you. Not too much detail. There's kind of a fine line. I know people that will be in the closing with you for two hours. It's kind of ridiculous. If, if you're getting two hours of information, it's like overload and it's too much. But um, we do try to go into a little more detail. So a couple of things that title companies do for you, just really brief, is that we're going to prepare your property for closing. Um, we clear off old liens, we get the HOA information, we try to get that to the lender, we work with the lender, get them everything that they need. That's what happens in the very, very beginning. Um, most people don't know that we even do any of that, but that's okay. Sometimes it's a lot of work, sometimes it's really easy. We like it when it's easy. Um, then we prepare and verify all the documents. And you know, we don't always catch everything, but it's our job to make sure that your purchase contract is fully executed and that we have all the addendums. We have to make sure that the lender docs are right. Uh, we've got docs and they spelled your name wrong, or there's a middle initial wrong or missing, or not Jason, though, he's perfect. talking with something like this, you guys I don't make mistakes. Yeah, but I mean, stuff happens, and so we try to watch for that. Um, Sometimes maybe there's a lien that the seller has that the seller's title company didn't pay attention to or an old judgment or something and they and so you know we we work with them and make sure we catch those kinds of things. So that's something that we do for you. Um, and then we go and sit in the closing, we try to make you feel comfortable, and we assist you in signing and notarizing all your documents. We try to explain what's on every page, but again, not too much detail because honestly, some of it some of it's kind of ridiculous. Um, and I, since we're at that, I will tell you, things you, that you really need to pay attention to are the HUDs or the settlement statements. And that's the part that has all the numbers on it. That's the part that your agent and your lender are there to go over with you. Because honestly, that's the part that needs to be right. And so when we go through the numbers, it'll go through your loan origination fees, your title fees, your HOA fees, and how much money you need to bring in to close. And those are the most important things on there. Um, your first payment letter. It's always good to know when your first payment's due. It's kind of important and how much it's going to be. And then just your note, really, and your deed of trust. And your package, the way you close it, you know, it's about that thick of papers. And most people look at that and they say, oh, my word, that's so many papers. But really, it's just those first few documents that are key. The rest of it is disclosures, attorney's forms. Right, Jason? That's exactly what it is. Somebody threatened to sue somebody, and so we got a new form. And, and literally, that's what a lot of that is. And so a lot of it is just they have to disclose it so that they can't ever, you can't ever say, I didn't know. So that's what a lot of that is. Um, and then I just had a couple of quick tips. And these are just for when you go to your closing, if you do, or when you're working with your title company, you're like, just a couple of things just to make it go smoother. And um, the first one, and these are really from my perspective, but the first one is be willing to take off time off work to get your paperwork signed and to do your closing. A lot of people refuse to take off work. And you know what, we'll do anything, I'll do anything for my agents, I'll do anything for you because I care about you and I want you to get your closing done and I want you to be able to get into your new home. But if, if you're trying to do something impossible, like really, really late at night, but yet it's gotta be in Colorado the next morning and fun, we've just missed FedEx and it's not gonna happen. So I think um, that's important that you be a little bit flexible and know that a lot of it has to happen during business hours so that we can make things happen. Sometimes I'll do a really late night closing and there's something wrong on the loan docs and there's nobody still at the lender's office for me to call and get corrected docs. So then we have to come back the next day. So just little things like that. Um, the other one is about bringing kids to the closing. And I know this is, we love the kids and the kids don't bother us. The problem is I, we have coloring books and toys and the problem is, is it's hard for you guys to concentrate. Um, I've seen lots of parents leave pretty frazzled when their kids have been running around and tearing apart the place, which we all think they're cute and 
it's kind of a nice break from us because we're dealing with paperwork all day long. We love to have the kids. In fact, I sat on the couch and played with some this afternoon. But for parents, for you guys, I'm signing it's hard because you do feel kind of frazzled when you leave. So babysitter is a good idea. And then the other thing that I would just say is if you like to read, if you're a reader, let everybody, let everybody know ahead of time. Um, there's nothing wrong with wanting to read every single word, but in the time frame that's scheduled in the closing, it's probably not going to happen. And so the best thing that you can do is tell your lender or your title company, you know, I'm not comfortable signing until I've read everything. I respect that. You know, we'll get you the documents a day before. So you can take the time and go through and look at everything and read everything. And that way you feel comfortable. The worst thing for me is for you to come into a closing and feel pressure or feel uncomfortable about what you're signing and maybe not trust the people in the transaction because it really is about trust. And so anything we can do to make it more comfortable for you or, or better, then that's, that's ultimately the goal. So, do you guys have any questions? No? I, crazy? I have just a, one quick other thing. So who, besides those that work in this as a profession, who knows what title insurance does? What does it protect? What does car insurance protect? Depends on how much the many things you pay for. That's true. That's true. <laughs> but it, it, it protects for future things that may happen in the future, correct? That's a good answer. What does insurance, title insurance cover, you know? It's a little bit different in that way. It doesn't cover you for anything in the future. It, yes, it covers anything in the past. From the day of recording back. So not necessarily even mistakes, but what could happen is sometimes someone will hire somebody to come do some work on their house. They'll have the deck done or something like that, and they don't, they don't pay them. And so someone will put a lien on that property and, and say, you can't sell or refinance this property until you pay me. That's a mechanics lien. And so what we do as a title company is we go and search that property and we ensure, either we make sure that they pay off those liens and that they get it taken care of, or we make sure that the person that placed the lien releases it. And if they do, or if we feel like it's not they don't have validity in that lien that they placed on there, then we'll take the risk and say, you know what, we're going to insure over that, and we're going to ensure that you have that property free and clear. And we see some weird stuff sometimes. Yeah, and, and that way, Jason, you know, he's going to give you the money, and they're going to, you're going to buy that house, you're going to feel like it's yours. You really want it to be yours. So that title insurance, it gives you clear title to that property, free of encumbrances, so free of anybody else having liens against it, except for the loan. The loan will be that first lien position. They do have a, a valid lien on that property because they put up that money until it's paid off and then it's yours. But that's something, just a little bit of information on how that insurance covers you. And you only pay one premium when you close on that property and then you're protected from then on from anything that happened before you bought that property. And as a buyer, you're just paying for the lender's policy. You're actually paying to ensure the lender's lien position. Um, the seller pays for an owner's policy that's actually better, it has more coverage. So the seller in the state of Utah pays for an owner's policy that goes to you to protect from the day of closing back. So they're protecting that no funny business has gone on. Um, there are things, and that's really too detailed, but there are things that can go on that can make your property unsellable or you know uninsurable, but your owner's policy will protect you against those things. So that's something else that's good to know. Now, if your house has damage, you don't call us. We won't fix that. <laughs> that's homeowner insurance, right? <laughs> and do we no. have a home warranty person here tonight? No. Okay, so another big thing that we do in the closing is that we suggest that you get a home warranty. Um, there's several good home warranty companies out there. Your agents can recommend one. But that's something that we go over in the closing. Home warranty is really good. Um, my, I'll give my own personal example. We bought a house a year ago that was older and had actually been vacant for three years. So we sort of did every add-on that we could um, just to make sure that we were covered and we used it quite a bit for a warranty company. And I feel bad because I do business with them and I kept calling them. But they were great and they never hesitated. And there was even one that will come and rekey your home for just the service call, which is awesome. It's 60 bucks. Anyway. It's 60 bucks and they'll come and put every single lock on the same key and give you all new keys. And you know what, when you're buying a home, 
I don't care if you're on a tight budget or not, you need to change those locks. You don't know who has a key. You don't know if it's been in a key box, somebody could have taken the key out and made a copy. I mean, you just don't know. So well, you, those home warranties are generally in the four to $500 range. And the and seller will pay for them. If your ovens go out, like a couple months after you move in there, or in that first year, then they'll, they'll replace it for that sixty dollar for that sixty dollar to repair it or replace it. And so it's huge. It really yeah, is. that's something else that we we try to you know title company we're the third party we're neutral, so we just try to make sure you guys are protected. Um, make sure your lenders taking good care of you, your agents taking good care of you, and that you have a home warranty if you want it. So anyway, that's all. Sweet, thanks guys. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks so, thanks so much. So right now we've got Keith. Uh, Keith Beckstead, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. So he, he's an appraiser, so we've got some homeowners here. And the nice thing is a lot of people don't see the things in the background or get any input from a, an appraiser. So we've got him here to kind of just give us a couple quick pointers about what he looks for in homes. Okay. There's not, there's really not a whole lot you can do with increasing the value of your home. Is that even on? Yeah, yeah you just have to have it close. Close and talk loud. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's, with, as far as appraising goes, it's mainly what houses are out there that are similar to yours in the market. So, and what's selling. And right now the market's really hot. There's a lot of things selling very quickly. Um, as an appraiser, what I look for is I look for something similar uh, in age, style, um, maybe upgrades, um, whatever it is, you know, somebody's done. <clears throat> My, probably the most frequently asked question that I get is, what can I do to increase the value of my house? And basically the only thing that I found as an appraiser that really increased value is increasing your, what we call GLA or gross living area, which is um, any square footage above ground. And that doesn't happen very often. So there's different things that you can do to increase the value of your house as far as like adding a patio or a deck or a fence or landscaping. Um, my parents, uh, my, well, we had a big family and my mom wanted to have a big uh, family room so we added that onto the back of the house. And when I actually did the data to figure out how much it increased the value, it increased the value a whole lot. Um, so, I told my mom, I said, you know, I hope you enjoy it, because that's kind of what it is, you're stuck with. Does anybody have any questions? So, so a question that I get a lot uh, as a real estate agent is, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put 10 grand worth of granite in there, and that's going to make my home worth a lot more than the 10,000. Right. What's your take on that? Um, I, the question I get that's similar to that is, I want to finish my basement. Okay, and I want to put all this in my basement. Yeah. I haven't really done a lot of research recently, but several years ago, um, I did a lot of crunching numbers and just trying to see, and typically it's 30 to 40 cents on the dollar. So it's something similar like, let's say you have a, um, I don't know, a average car that's probably $20,000, $25,000 car, and you put a six or $7,000 stereo system into it, you're not going to get the six or seven thousand dollars out of it. That's just kind of the way it is. You're going to get ten to twelve. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I have a truck, and you put um, tires and wheels on your truck, and it doesn't really increase the value of a whole heck of a lot. Uh, but it looks good and enjoy it. That's what I tell people. So as far as that goes, I hope you're going to enjoy that because um, you're not going to get it out. Now, the one thing about something doing something like that that I found is that if you do a lot of extras that somebody else doesn't have, it'll definitely help your house sell a lot quicker. Um, you might not get dollar per dollar out of it, but somebody's obviously going to choose your house versus somebody else's. So, any other questions? So what you're saying is the best thing to get your value up on your home is to get your neighbor to sell for more. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Or, or if you see your neighbor has sold their house for X amount of dollars, that's when you want to sell. Yeah. <laughs> uh, right now, what we're having a problem with, at least I'm having a problem with, not all the time, but some of the time, is that uh, somebody is going to list their house and um, 
you have three or four offers, and I, I haven't seen it as much now as maybe I did last spring, where somebody is selling their house for over what it's listed at, and, and probably one of the biggest issues is it's coming in at value, or uh, you know the appraiser. You, you get an appraiser and they're going, okay, God, I want to sell my house for 150. You have an offer for 160, and you have an appraisal for 140. And my personal opinion is, is that if somebody's willing to, and, and actually this is the definition of a comparable, is that if somebody's willing to sell a house for X amount of dollars, and somebody's willing to buy it for X amount of dollars, well, that's what the house is worth. Um, but right now, recently we've had a difficult time proving that on paper. That may be logistically correct, but quantifying on, on, you know, on an appraisal can be difficult. Does anybody have questions? And this is a great opportunity if you guys are looking to, to sell the house or just kind of curious about what their what an appraiser looks for. Uh, so a lot of people say appraisers just appraise it at the sales price. I hear that <laughs> in closing. It's from the people. That's true. Yeah. Well, that's true. And, and and I I mean I know a lot of appraisers and we talk about this as, as far as appraisers together. You know, I mean, what do you do? And. You know, I, I've done several appraisals re recently, especially new construction, and um, you know, I come in higher than the sales price because that's what I think it's worth. In the back of my mind, I'm going, "Golly, I really think it's worth more than that." But I mean, you, you, you try to look at the comparables, and yes, I know exactly what you're talking about. You go, "Okay, well, well, I mean, here we are," and and it makes it easy to do it that way too. I mean, you just hey, you know, I got to find three or four comparables that are going to support. X amount of dollars that you sold for. Um, that's not always the case, but yes, it happens a lot. What percentage of, you know, you have a, an offer um, and someone's willing to, to pay that, and what percentage of the time do you see that you can't find value on in those situations where people are, are paying more than maybe? I would probably say right now maybe 10%, 5 to 10%. Okay. Um, and you know, I mean, I personally try to call like a real estate agent, or um, I've done a lot of for sale by owners. So I go to whoever's selling the house, and I go, God, do you know anybody that has sold um, a property recently around you um, that didn't go through the MLS? Because we're in non-disclosure state in Utah, so you don't have to disclose your sales price. Can you use like a new build for a comparable? As far as uh, like a new construction home, like. Versus versus a regular sale. I'm just saying, like, if, if you're having a hard time finding comparables and there's a one in the neighborhood that's under construction, it would bring the price up. Can you use that? I can use that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm careful with that because you don't want to overlook something that's similar. But if I can't find something similar, then yes, I'm, I'm at least personally, as far as an appraiser goes, I'm one willing to do that. Um, what I do is I, I'll start with certain parameters that an underwriter or the lender is going to require us to, to have. And if I can't find anything, then I just start expanding parameters, whether it's um, time frame, mileage, or you know, miles out, um, year built, that type of thing. Um, as far as garages go, would you say that garages add value similar to how you described um, finishing a basement? Like dollar per dollar? Yeah. Um, what I do is I try to find something that, I mean, in fact, I had something similar where somebody had a two-car garage and then they had a detached garage in the back. So what I'm going to do as far as the appraiser goes is that, first of all, I want to find something similar to your house. And if I can't find something similar that has that detached garage, then I'm going to go out somewhere else and find that so I can prove that on paper. If I don't, if I can't find out, it's really tough because most underwriters are not being quite as lenient as they used to be. And so if I make a $3,000 or $5,000 or $10,000 adjustment, um, I need to have something to support that. But if I do, and it's called a line item adjustment, it may not make a whole lot of sense, but you know, if I pull four cells that are similar and none of them have a garage, the lender's going to say, well, we're not going to keep the garage. I've actually had that happen to me. So, as far as the appraiser goes, I'm going to try to find something that, you know, even if it's like five miles away, just to support or substantiate that difference in value. Because there obviously is utility and there's a difference in value in regards to that. 
Well, every part of that transaction, every person that, that works in that industry, they're accountable to somebody. And appraisers, unfortunately, end up accountable to a lot of people. Yes. Uh, a lot of times it's the real estate agents, but especially if you're getting a loan, a loan on that property, um, that, that appraisal goes through the underwriting process as well. And they go through it with a magnifying glass, basically, to make sure that, that it makes sense, that they're willing to lend that much money and give that much value to that home when they're pushing that money forward too. So yeah. he can't just look at it and say, you know what, I think that's worth that much, so that's not what I'm put. He has to quantify it and, and make that make sense to the underwriter as well. I've seen underwriters come back and say, I don't agree with this. Yeah. You know, and even though he's the professional in that in, in, in that profession in appraising homes, underwriters know better than he does, right? Well, <laughs> But, but they have guidelines that they have to follow. Right. I mean, they, they're they're on they're scrutinized as much as I am. No, you're exactly right. And that's and, what and no one's accountable. Yeah, yeah. I, no, they're I, usually just picky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I have that happen all the time. Where I mean, I, and personally, I mean, I, I've gone to people and I go, I know your house is worth more than what I'm showing it on paper, but right now I can't show it on paper. And what I what I'll typically we do as an, uh, as an appraiser, and this is probably more for lenders and um, real estate agents, is that I'll look for like maybe something under contract. Uh, you know, find something that may sell in a week or two, because if it's going to sell in a week or two, that could, I mean, it can change the value, it can change everything in the entire transaction very easily. So, uh, one thing that I've also experienced recently is homeowners coming to me and saying, hey, I want an appraisal on my house because I want to make sure that it can appraise for this much before I try and sell it for that much. And that's happened quite a bit, well, much more recently than it's happened in years. Any more questions? Anybody else? Perfect. Well, hey, thanks so much, Keith, oh, for coming by. I know you've got some things to get to, but we appreciate him coming out here. And uh, so what, what we'd like to do, well the reason I'd like to, or why we had the appraiser come was to just kind of just show you that sometimes when you put in a lot of money, let's say it was the granite or finishing the basement, that you don't always recoup that cost dollar for dollar. So like he was saying about 30 cents on the dollar, 30, 40 cents, it, a lot of times we see that, Cheryl and I, we see that all the time, you know, unless it's a certain feature that will definitely help sell it. It's definitely good to have. So what we'd like to do is we'd like to have Jeff, Jeff Castile with Castile Property Management. He's going to come and, and talk to us just a little bit about property management. So those that are looking to keep a rental property but don't want to landlord it and deal with the tenants, this is your guy right here. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for putting this together and inviting me. Um, so my name is Jeff. I'm a real estate investor and property manager. Um, just to give you a little bit of information about myself. Um, been married for 10 years, got five kids. Um, the oldest is eight, and four of them are boys, eight, six, and then twins that are four. And I have a daughter that's two. So, um, a lot of work there, more for my wife than myself. But, um, <clears throat> and then um, uh, I come from a large family. Um, my parents were investors, real estate investors. Um, my dad was in the military, and every time we moved around, he just kept the house that he was in and um, moved, bought a new house, and rented the other one out. So, so that's kind of where my interest was sparked. Um, and uh, growing up all the time, I, I, always, um, I always wanted to own my own company, I always wanted to run my own business. I could never really see myself working for somebody else, and um, my, I wasn't really sure ever doing what, doing what. didn't know what, what that would be. So um, my... I kind of discovered that and found my passion after doing loans for several years. I uh, uh, got into property management. Um, it was uh, at that point I had several of my own properties, and um, I was just struggling. I was struggling with taking care of them, holding down a full-time job, and and family. And so um, talking to my parents, they said, "Well, go get a property management company." And I thought, "Oh, that sounds like a good idea." So. I went and signed one up, and to be honest with you, it was it was tough. I, I spent the next year managing the management company. It it just didn't work out very well. Um, so I talked to my dad, 
and he said, well, that's just how it goes. You know, sometimes you get a good manager, sometimes you get good tenants, sometimes you don't. And, and I thought, well, it, you know, real estate's, real estate's expensive. You know, there's a lot of risk there. You know, you put a lot of money up front, big down payments, lots of fees, and just to go, well, let's see how it turns out. You know, that, that just didn't compute for me. So um, I put together a list of some things that I thought how properties should be managed. And I thought, this, you know, this is kind of the kind of stuff I want to see somebody doing to take care of my property, so I know I'm being taken care of. Went around a bunch of management companies trying to, you know, see what I could find, and, and it just, you know, I didn't find anything exciting. Um, nothing that really, that really uh, floated my boat. So, um, anyway, my wife, um, she's very wise, I remind her of that often, and she told me to start my own company. She said, you know, you, you know what you're doing, you've got a whole list there, you know what you want, and, and so I, uh, um, I thought about that for a while, and I, and I thought, well, okay, if I'm going to do this, it's got to be done right. So um, I went ahead and did that. I, I with the encouragement of my wife, I quit my job, and I went and got some licensing and, uh, and started managing properties. And I, I, I was a, uh, I'm a firm believer that proper management and proper procedures actually saves the homeowner money. Uh, it saves a lot more than it costs. And that's the way I wanted my company to be run. And so that's the way I set things up. <clears throat> I also, um, in setting up my procedures and things, I, I wanted to keep in mind that um, I constantly ask myself, how do I want my properties managed? You know, if, if at this situation with my properties, what would I want done? And so being an investor myself, I have that perspective. And um, uh, several, year, it's several years later, I manage about 100 properties for people. Uh, I have tons of happy clients, um, and uh, and it's it's exciting. Um, I love real estate. I love property management. I love coming into work each day. Um, and uh, you know, for me, real estate is a uh, it's a it's a great retirement vehicle. I look at it as a long term investment. Um, a lot of us ask ourselves, you know, we say, well, you know, it'll be so great when we're retired and our house is paid off. And, you know, we, we all kind of dream about those days. And um, I, also, I also think, well, how much better will it be if you have two houses paid off, or three, or more? And, you know, there's ways to do it. You get a great lender, you get great real estate agents, you get great professionals on your side, great title companies, and you, and you just put it all together. And, um, it, you know, and then when you reach your retirement age, you can have a whole bunch of houses paid off as much as you, you know, as much as you want to get the professionals to take care of the details for you. Um, and so I, I'd be happy to go over what those details are, how I run my company, things that I do for you um, as a manager, and what I, what I can do for your properties. Um, my website's a great resource. Um, I've got little short videos on there, lots of forms you can download, information. Um, if you prefer to meet in person, I'm happy to do that. I take phone calls, I set appointments, I come by and talk to you. If you're looking to buy a new property and you're not sure if this is going to be a good rental, give me a call. You know, I can talk to you about it. And if, if needed, I can even come out and take a look at it and say, well, this is my opinion. I think it's great or, well, you know, I, I've had experience with this neighborhood. You know, and so, you know, use me. Um, I'd be happy to, happy to talk to you about anything. I, I've passed around some... Uh, some little clipboards and things here. A lot of the information and details is in there, but that kind of gives you an idea of who I am, why I'm in real estate, why I do property management. So, anyway, any uh, any questions? Yeah. Okay, I have been seeing uh, some houses say legal assisted apartments. What does that mean? Like, it doesn't. Um, is it sounds like she got a notice on her door. <laughs> <laughs> well, they. If, if I'm under, if, if I understand it right, there, there's some properties where um, people people will rent out their basement when they shouldn't. Um, cities don't like that, and so there's some where it's legal and there's some where it's not. And so if you have a legal accessory apartment, am I right on that? Yeah, it's more of like a owner occupied, where you're renting out the basement. So where the landlord, the tenant down below, is renting it, if it's in an area where it's zoned to be able to do that, that can be a legal accessory apartment. If the landlord doesn't live there, the landlord then is 
more it would be considered a duplex. Right, which is which is totally different. We might be able to use it as an accessory apartment for the homeowners upstairs, for example, and tenants downstairs. But you might not be able to rent it out as a duplex where you just have tenants in both units. So it's just one of those zoning things you have to check before you buy it and make sure whatever your intent is, you can use it that way. I've actually heard of people that finish their basement and use it that way, and the city gets wind of it and uh, requires they rip the kitchen out in the basement. Just take it out. Based on the Provo. What's that? <laughs> Provo. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Different cities are worse than others. Yeah. But your realtor can help you and check on that. Like if you're thinking of buying one like that, suddenly something you want to make sure. Like Provo will give you a letter saying it's like an official legal. Yeah. Some other things with Provo, they require you to get a license, mm -hmm. yeah. a business license for property, if you're going to have a rental property. And so, just little things like that that you might not find out until somebody's sending you a nasty letter. Unless you have professionals on your side, you may know. So, um, uh, one thing I, kind of my own personal motto of how I manage is um, I'm always telling myself I'm going to spend my day managing so that I don't have to spend tomorrow putting out fires. That's, that's how I take care of things. Um, the, the, the big frustration I've, I've, I've had in the past with, uh, with management properties prior to me managing them, and then uh, that I know my parents have had, a lot of other people is, um, it, it, it just feels like that, they, that people run around just to put out fires, take care of problems. That's just not how I manage. Of course, if a problem comes up, I take care of it. But my goal is to work to prevent problems. So, anyway. Any other questions about property management? Yeah. What are some examples of, like, what are the um, Proper screening is the biggest. Um, I, have, I have no problem telling applicants no. Um, and doing that, it doesn't even prolong the process of getting place filled, I can still usually get places filled in two or three weeks. Um, but credit, criminal background check, verify employment and income, check with past landlords, all that has to be done, and it can be done fast too. Um, when an application comes in, I jump on it. Um, usually the very day I get an application, I have an answer. So it's more based around making sure the property is occupied and it comes make it highly that, that's a big part of it. Um, and then regular inspections, keep an eye on the property so that if, uh, if somebody's just doing something there that they shouldn't do, you don't want to find out about it two years after they've been living there. So regular inspections, just keep an eye on the place. Um, do you show the property to the prospective? I do, okay. yeah. Um, and uh, you know, little things, little things you can do, I'll, I'll give some tips. Um, if you know if you if you want to be a do-it-yourself, for one thing, I highly suggest that it is this helps out a lot. Is you can get keypad deadbolts, put those on the put those on the place. Um, it helps in a lot of different ways. Um, one, you don't have to rekey the place every time a tenant moves out, it saves you money there because um, the tenants just don't get a key. You know they can reprogram the lock as often as they want and put in their own codes, and when they move out, you reset it. Um, and the other way that helps is in showing it. Um, one of the biggest hurdles that I used to have in filling vacancies was setting up appointments. People would call, you know, they call when they're thinking about it, when it's on their mind, when they have some time. And if I'm not able to jump up from my desk and run to that place immediately, sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. You know, I'll say, even if I say, yeah, I'll be there later this afternoon. A lot of times they just don't show up, you know. And from their perspective, they've got a list of 20 places they're possibly interested in. The one that is most immediately accommodating to what their schedule is for that day it is where they gravitate towards. And so what I can do is I get some information from them, I give them the code, they can go in, and of course I'm not regularly resetting the code, keep the place secure. I've done it that way for years and years with all the places I manage. It works out great, it gets places filled quickly, it accommodates people. They can go right on my website, fill out an application. Um, you know, it's it's fast, it's easy. So the other thing is, if you have one tenant lined up to move in the day after one moves out, um, and you know you're going to have to get some cleaning done, carpet cleaning, and you know that one thing that's been hanging around that the handyman needs to fix needs to get done before two, 
you don't have to juggle keys between all of them. You can just give the code to the handyman, the cleaning person, and the, and the carpet cleaners. They all go in that same day, out, it's ready for the vehicle the next day. So that's, that's a, big, a big thing that you can do. Um, other things that I do is uh, I've got an attorney retainer program. Um, uh, and what that does is, you know, the, if there's, um, and this, this comes up every once in a while still, it's rare, but it still comes up every once in a while, where, you know, you, you just still get a problem with it. Um, screening, screening will take care of most of those problems, but never 100%. Um, and so if you need to do an eviction, uh, the, the problem always was the owner is faced with a situation where they say, okay, rent hasn't come in this month. Do I want to give the tenant another week or two, or do I want to move on it quickly and get this big attorney bill? <laughs> you know, and so they're kind of faced with that dilemma, and um, most of the time, giving them another week or two is not the right answer. You know, it, it depends on how the tenant's acting. If they're not communicating, it's never the right answer to get more time. Um, but sometimes, you know, you, you can usually tell. It, it all depends on communication. But um, yeah, so so what I did is I set up a program where nine dollars a month. Um, should there be a need for that, uh, eviction costs are covered. Um, court costs are covered. Um, delivering the notices. It's all all the expenses, everything related. Even if we just even if we don't have a, an eviction going on, we just have. We need to go to the attorney and get some legal advice because of some situation about the house or the lease or whatever, just just to get some advice. All that's covered with this nine dollars a month, and so the owner doesn't have that dilemma anymore. It frees up my hands to quickly move on it, get um, and and let the tenant know we're serious, and either the tenant needs to move on or they get evicted, or and then we get a new one in there. And in those kind of situations, speed is is what saves the owner. Uh, money. Um, the, the thing that I've seen a lot with um, uh, new clients that I have coming to me to sign up is they're, you know, they're frustrated with the situation where they, they well, that exact same kind of situation where they, uh, just last year I had somebody call me up and they said they hadn't been paid rent for four months. And, you know, I just, I, I was kind of flabbergasted. I thought, well, are the tenants still living there? You know, and they and they were. You know, and so, um, you know, I just thought that was amazing. But um, so it, you know, it frees up my hands so that I can say, okay, we have a problem here. I can move on it quickly. Um, an eviction, if it goes all the way to the end of going to court and having the judge say this tenant has to move, and we have somebody come out and physically remove them from the property, which I've never had that happen, by the way. Um, I, I've got to the point of we had somebody there to remove them, but they were already gone. So, anyway, knock on wood. But um, uh, yeah, if if that if we go from beginning to end, it can take five to six weeks. Um, and you know, it, it sounds harsh to move that quick on it, but um, you know, to be honest, the the tenants are given plen plenty and plenty, plenty, plenty of. Uh, notice. It, it's never a surprise for them. They, they know it's coming long before it comes. And and um, my job is to protect the homeowner. And in doing that, I can also be kind and courteous and polite to tenants that are having a tough time. My job is never to go and, and make them feel bad about themselves, feel terrible. Um, you know, it's just not necessary. I actually find things usually work smoother. If I, if I hold my ground, but I'm polite and I have a calm voice, and, and even if they, because of stresses in their life, they get mad and they start yelling and screaming, you know, I can take it, it's okay. Just stay calm, say, you know, and, and it's amazing how quickly their voice will calm down. How quickly, if I don't respond that way, how quickly they just they kind of go, okay, well, I'm, you know, I'm sorry. I have people apologize, you know, at times when they're really upset, it's just their stress. So, um, anyway, my job is just to facilitate that as quick as possible, and kindness does that surprisingly. You know, an attorney behind me, but kindness. So, but um, so, you know, that's some of the things, some of the procedures and, and policies that I have set up so that um, you as a homeowner can be protected. You know, things are going uh, quickly. But screening, 
to get us 90% of it. And um, you, as a as an individual, not as a company, there, there's new credit regulations and things that you, uh, unfortunately, are not able to pull credit. Um, so, and and so, if you wanted to pull credit, you'd have to find somebody that can do that for you. Um, it starts getting kind of complicated things. So. Um, that screening will save most of your problems, or will prevent most of your problems. Um, so if you are a do-it-yourselfer, do everything you can to do the screening, but do it fast, because people do, they don't wait around forever. So you don't want to miss out on, on a great tenant because you took too long. So. Yeah. Um, so for your company, is what you're consuming <laughs> but also, do we pay extra or something because it's in the house? Like, Good question. Yeah. Um, and that, that brings up something else that, you know, as part of my job, I manage maintenance issues when they come up. You know, the, the sink starts leaking. Um, tenants would go on my website, they'd submit a maintenance request, I send that to the plumber, the plumber goes out and takes care of it. We use the homeowner authorized um, beforehand a, a dollar or not. Um, that basically just says, if it's under this amount, just take care of it and don't bother me. If it's going to be over this amount, talk to me first. We've got to work some time. Um, and so, you know, I handle that. One thing that's unique to me is I don't mark up service calls. Um, that's something that, that um, I, I believe every other place does. But um, so if the plumber goes out and he charges 60 bucks, you'll get a copy of the invoice at 60 bucks. It doesn't turn into 100. So, but, but yeah, my job is to manage it. Um, I, I can't take on liability or cost of the property. Uh, my job is to manage it and help you manage it to make it successful. So, what is your price? Um, Eight percent is the is the short answer. When everything's going great, you know, you don't have any any maintenance expenses or, or any kind of vacancy or anything like that going on. You have eight percent less than nine dollars for that tree. Yeah. yeah. I just had a question. Um, is there like a certain area in Utah County or a certain all, place that's all more demand for rentals oh. that you notice? Um. You know, it, it's, it really seems to be all about the same as far as uh, Eagle Mountain kind of seems like an anomaly that I haven't quite figured out yet. I've got several rentals out there that I take care of in Eagle Mountain, and the only thing I haven't figured out is it just seems like some years when a vacancy comes up there that they'll, they just fly for market like hotcakes. You know, I put it on there and it's, I, I got, get like, you know, 15 calls, you know, the very day that I put it on. And then other years, like nothing. You know, I'll put the advertising out there and I don't get anything. So everything eventually rents. But um, Eagle Mountain just seems to have this fluctuation from year to year that I, I haven't quite figured out. But the rest of the county seems, uh, it all seems about the same. Um, it, it's more from neighborhood to neighborhood, I'd say. Um, one thing that you want to um, look for is uh, nicer neighborhoods tend to attract uh, people that are approvable on the application process. Um, whereas run down properties, some that look neglected or even older homes. Um, older homes are fine, but they usually need to look more kept up to not attract the wrong kind of people. Um, and, and I know that sounds harsh to say the wrong kind of people, but uh, part of the process is we're, um, we're basically betting on whether we're going to have problem. You know, we need to look at a tenant as they're going to be our business partner, essentially. Is this going to be a good business partner? Or is this going to be a bad business partner? Only history will tell, or only the future will tell, but we can usually make a pretty good um, figure it out uh, pretty good as just based on credit and criminal history and that kind of stuff. So, criminal insurance, so you don't have to look. You know, really run some problems and that as well. Uh, generally, no. Um, it, you know, it, it depends. Um, sometimes if their credit or maybe even a, some kind of criminal thing, you know, if it was a long time ago and it wasn't a big deal, um, sometimes we can work it out with extra deposit or a co-signer. Um, sometimes we can look over, you know, if, uh, if their credit just has uh, some medical bills went to collection but everything else is great, usually that's just fine. Um, the main things that I'm looking for on credit are, are they currently having financial trouble? Um, 
And if we did need to send them to collections, would they care? <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, um, you know, and of course, if there's ever anything from another management company or a landlord, then that's almost always decline. You know? So, um, but that's the biggest thing. Are they, you know, they, they don't need to have perfect credit. I don't, I don't go off of a credit score. I just need to know are they currently out of financial trouble and would they care if I needed to send them to collections? Um, so if you know, I pull it up and I see that they have bounce checks at every restaurant in town. Nope, decline. You know, they obviously don't care. So, so. okay, thanks. Awesome. All right, thanks so much, Jeff, for coming out and talking about that. So our, our final people are going to be Jason and Travis. Are you coming up too? Sorry, just whispering all the time. So, so Jason Bonk, he's a good friend of ours. We, he's personally done three, four of our loans, uh, working on another one for us right now. Uh, so he's with Veritas Funding, and he's going to talk a little bit about the the loan side of things. So here's Jason and Travis. And Travis, see if we can get him up here. Travis just sits there. He does. He just sits there. <laughs> That's the hard part about himself. <laughs> So the part that is, you know, I know that you guys, you said that you guys own it, and you, you guys own own right now as well. Yeah. Correct. How long have you guys owned for? 2011. So, three years. Okay. What about you? Same time. So, you know, it's, our side of it is kind of, it's, it can be very, very confusing. You know, I don't know how much you remember of the, of the process when you're going through buying but it probably wasn't super fun. You know, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of, of paperwork that you have to get together and a lot of different things that are, um, you know, you just, you're gonna question, you're gonna wonder why in the world are we getting this? We've already, a lot of it's redundant. But overall, the most important thing that, that I guess I wanna talk to you, about, you guys about tonight is that it is, someone can come in and say, bring, you know, show me how to do a, to do a loan. And I'm going to say, well, bring me that loan, and I'll show you how to do that loan. Everybody's situation is so unique that one tiny little detail can and will change the entire structure all the way through. So, and then you have to deal with, you know, FHA loans, conventional loans, VA, USDA, and then under each of those, you have different programs. Um, and so it can be very, very confusing. And it's important for you to know that exactly what's going to happen, you know, what, what the plan is. If you want to hold on to a property, the, you know, the one thing that I get is over and over again. To go conventional, we have to put 20% down. Not true. I have an FHA loan, so we can't get another FHA loan. Not true. You can. So there, there are all these different things, that, but if you don't put 20% down, then you have, you have to pay monthly mortgage insurance. That's not true either. There are ways to get around. There's a lot of different programs um, that, are, that, are, that are out there that can cater to what you guys need. And it can be a little nerve wracking for sure. You're like, well, you know, we have this other place. What if they don't make their payment? And that's a reality, right? If you're renting out the property that you're in right now, uh, we can't afford to. And even if we can't afford it, we don't want to. We don't want to have somebody not make their payment. And then we have our, our new home payment to make. And that's a reality, right? I mean, it, it can happen. That's the risk you take in having rental property. And, um, and so that's something that you have to factor into it. But there are, the other side of that is you're like, I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to necessarily be a landlord and I would rather just, I would rather just sell the property and not have to, not have to deal with it. You can go that route or like you was talking about management, you can, you can hire a manager, um, a management company that will, that will oversee it. So to take the headache away from you, um, but overall it is it's very important, right? That on on mortgage mortgage financing there are so many different options and so many different um, you know situations that going a certain going with a certain program is you know there there are pros and cons to, to just about all of them, and you really have to sit down and walk through every tiny little detail of it because. If you know your situation is not going to be uh, not be redundant, like when I was talking earlier, that everybody's situation is so unique, uh, you really have to 
but just go through it and make sure that you're you know, asking all the questions and, and really digging into it. And I think a lot of times people don't want to ask a lot of questions because they're like, oh, you know, we, I should just get this. We, we understand that this isn't something we, that you're going to get. This isn't what you do, and you're entitled. This is your money that you're spending, and you're entitled to as many questions or as many dumb questions as you think they are to ask. This is your money. We're not, we're not going to work it and paying your bills. So I, I, it makes me nervous when people come in and they don't ask, they don't ask a lot of questions because I know that they're, that they're in there. And, you know, it's one thing for you not to, not to care, like, oh, I don't care. And spouses, you know, usually, you're, usually they'll, when they come in there, they'll sit behind, sit behind the desk, sit behind the desk talking to them, and they will, one of them's a lot more, you know, a lot more involved in it than the other one. And it's, it's just how, how it is. But at the end of the day, this is, this is you guys' money and you need to, you need to treat it, you know, you, you need to, it, it's, it's sacred for lack of a better word. You know, just making one tiny little difference of an eighth of a percent on interest rates through the life of this loan, what's the, what's, you know, is it realistic that you're gonna own a home for 30 years? It's probably not very realistic and I'll take that bet with anybody in here. As your primary residence, you will move. But uh, the, it's with Travis. Travis has worked with me for four years now. Four, yeah, it has been four years. So he was just a little pup. You know, thing just, you know, just didn't have any clue. But you know, it, it's a process, and it is important to for you to have a connection with who you're working with. And I've said this time and time again um, when I've talked to different people. You can take a you know, you can take a very good loan officer and you can take really good clients and it just doesn't work, right? Same thing with agents. You know, you can take really good, really, a really good real estate agent and a really good loan officer and it just doesn't, there, there has to be a chemistry there because there's a lot of trust that's, that's involved in it. You're, you're naked in front of us, right? It, you, you've got your, your finances that, that are laid out and sometimes people think, oh, you know, this is embarrassing. Believe me, there is nothing, there is nothing that I haven't seen and I've done it so long now, I've, I've done it for 10 years now, that it is a, I, I don't look at, a, at somebody's finances and, and, and think, oh my gosh, you know, look at this. I just look at it in a sense of, this is what we, what we need to do to get this done, to get you to the situation that you want to be in that makes the most sense. So, you know, um, but overall there, as far as loan programs go, and I, I just, if there are any questions as far as, specific situations, um, I can answer them now for you, or if it's something you'd rather talk in private about, um, I'll obviously give you my contact information and can answer those questions for you, but is there anybody that has any questions specifically on anything? That was easy. <laughs> I, 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 I answered there with those. I have a question. Okay. Um, you mentioned clients not having questions. Mm -hmm. What kind of questions would one ask? Uh, um, stupid question. <laughs> <laughs> <A lot of laughs> I, I was just trying to think of something. I don't know when you so well. There, there's a range, right? I mean, and the, the questions are going to come as I is as, as I start to feel. The first thing, whenever I meet with somebody, is I'm going to let them. I'm going to let them talk. You know, what is? Tell me what. Tell me what you're trying to accomplish. And some people, they'll they'll they know right then. You know. Well, I've never bought a place, or this is we've owned a place for X amount of years, and we want more room, or we want to be in a different area, or we want to we want our payment to be less. We think we can afford more, and just in in letting people express themselves, I'm gonna majority of the time I'm gonna know exactly kind of what the questions they're gonna ask. But there are tougher situations, right? Well, we went through some. Some hard times three years ago, and we had a foreclosure. We had a short sale, and my friend was telling me that I can't do this because I, you know, because we we have to wait X amount of time, and so you know, it, it just takes the initial, and then that obviously opens up a lot of more questions, right? I mean, at, at that point, I'm gonna have questions for for you or anybody else, and then it just leads into it. But most questions, what are what are interest rates? What are fees? How does this work? What's the timeline? You know, what's the process? Um, there's anything you can imagine. Are you single? I'm like, no, I'm married, sorry. <laughs> I get that a lot. So, yeah. Um, I think that's a good question. But, you know, you want to be informed, right? This is, this is, 
you've gone through a lot of things tonight. You're, all these things that you're seeing right now, I'm sure you're just thinking, holy hell, like, how am I going to, like, how do we even put this together? And it really does come back to trust. There's a lot of trust that you're putting in individuals that that you you need to be able to connect with, and you you just have to, you know, kind of open up and let everybody know. We, we can't, we obviously aren't going to know what you're, what you're thinking and what your true what your true feelings are and why. And absolutely, there are people that come in and the, the husband's on board and the wife's not or vice versa. It does. And then it turn into a therapist. I'm really good. And I think I'd be cheaper. <laughs> a lot of criers. A lot of criers. <laughs> you know, so there's the husband wants a third car garage, but the wife wants to remodel the kitchen. Stay with her at You know, should we refinance it and drop it? Should we pull money out of our home? Can we do that? How much? Do, I mean, there's just think about all the things that you've. Obviously, you you have questions, or you wouldn't be here tonight, right? And so, you want to be more informed about about the situation. It doesn't mean that you're going to do something right now. It doesn't mean that you're going to do something. You, you may not be ready for a couple years, but it is. I think it's very, very, very important not to overlook how you know how. Um, how, how important is it to understand the whole process? Because if you don't understand it, it's going to leave you to it's going to leave you feeling vulnerable. And if you're feeling vulnerable, you're going to, you're going to to you know it's not going to be a good situation. At the end of the day, if someone is is looking to buy another home and or just purchase a new home, it it doesn't really do you any good, right? I mean, it should be exciting. It should be fun, and it shouldn't be as it shouldn't be overly stressful or everything's going to be stressful because it's new and it's going to be the same feelings that you had when you bought the place the first time. You're probably thinking like, how, you know, how are we going to afford this or what are we thinking or making the right decision? And after you made the first couple of payments, you're like, oh, we could have, you know, we should have done this a long time ago. There are benefits to owning a home, obviously, and everybody wants to feel like it is, and when I use the word home, I mean, Home is condo, townhome, home, home, um, trailer. I grew up in northern Florida, so uh, there are a lot of goosenecks that are still attached to where you lay your head down night. But there, you know, just be, in, be informed and, and ask, ask the questions, and not just ask the questions, ask the hard questions. And feel feel comfortable with who you're working with because the last thing you want to do is is get yourself involved in a situation that, that you don't feel like you, you can you know you can be yourself and that's what this is all about right we we want to be ourselves and we want to be able to to inform you to the best of our ability and and let you know the pros and cons of every situation that you're dealing with yes okay I have a question so we have a room and. We were looking, and there was one house, I remember it needed some fixing of uh -huh. more than that we had saved. Yep. And so can you get like a loan to purchase the house and then a loan to fix up the house? Like how does that work? Good question. So you can answer your question, can you get a loan to purchase another home, to purchase a home? And can you get money to fix up a home after the fact? Depending upon where the funds are coming from is a loan. It has to come from secured from a secured line, meaning checking account, savings account, car loan, home equity line. Uh, it can't come from a credit card. It can't come from you know from um, from cash. You can't just go pull cash out of the underneath your mattress and throw it in. It has to be what's called seasoned, and that's getting a little a little deeper into it, but. Uh, but then after the fact, it's really going to depend on the loan program that you choose, right? If you want to, how, depending on how much it's going to cost for you to take money out of it, how much you need to fix it up, and when that's going to take place. So there are all the there are all there are limitations to what you how much you can pull out depending on the value, and limitations to to the timing that you can pull it out. Because and the reason they have these time limits are because back in the day when everything was going on, there were a lot of people taking advantage of a of a very frivolous system. Uh, you know, appraisers were being paid off. Did you not? Keith pulled up in a Ferrari tonight. Did you see that? So appraisers were getting paid off, and they were just they values just went through the roof, you know. And it wasn't sustainable. It wasn't sustainable, as we found out. I didn't think it would come as as quickly as it came and hit as hard as it hit, but it did. It did. 
and then you know you guys found yourself in a good position buying in 2011 uh, from people's bad choices. <laughs> so yes and yes. To go along with that, also there are loan programs that are out there, um, which you could check with you know with agents on it, but they are programs where there is money set aside to do repairs on the home. So those are a little harder to come by because they are home specific, but they do exist. Mm -hmm. That's how I sit down and get Anything anybody can anything else you make? Go ahead, go ahead. Well, I just make sure I get your contact because I have a friend. She said that they have fell through they sell. Mm -hmm. They really want to move and they said it can their loan won't allow them to have two mortgages. Mm -hmm. So this one And that could be the case, right? I mean whoever they talk to could be could give have given them the right information. They could be working with a good loan officer that understands, you know, how it works. But usually not, usually there it is. <laughs> <laughs> So I wanted to get your information so she see if it's a <laughs> Oh, I should have said that because this was like, yeah, see, they're all idiots. <laughs> There's a lot known. I mean, it, it really is. It's a, it, it's a, on each program I was going through, um, and there's a, for an FHA loan, there's a book that's about this thick, and it is, it's just such a crazy amount of, of different things and, and understanding and how it works and but at the same time you know in understanding somebody's financial situation and what they're looking to accomplish you kind of just can go to that what that section is and not have to worry I know that's really complicated but so in, my, a lot of in my mind it makes sense what's that there's a lot of loopholes there are a lot of loopholes there are there's a lot of loopholes and I have covered almost damn near every one <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of loopholes. Oh, what are you Near Jacksonville. Super, super nice area. McClenny. No, it's not. You're from West Palm? Yeah. Yeah, you want yours is a lot nicer area. My area is a lot nicer. My area is not nice. <laughs> it's not at all. It's near Jacksonville. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm probably the guy I can't pass Math 990, but, you know, did you know that existed? I'm looking at you like, what's that? Like, she's like, did you do loans? I like all these computers. Yeah, but it's like... Take your calculator next time you have that class. I did, but like, I was telling, I told Travis before, I'm like, when they start throwing like letters with numbers, and like, <laughs> uh, it throws me off. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. It's funny, the loans are kind of their own thing. I mean, we've done, literally, have done a loan for a guy with an MBA from Harvard, which he's sharp. We did a loan for a BYU Two. finance professor. Oh, yeah, a couple of Harvard guys. And um, at the end of the day, as smart as they are, you know, even even some of this loan stuff can go over their head. And so just, you build a relationship of trust, and yeah, they can, they can probably outsmart us on a lot of things, but. Uh, when it comes to the loan programs and, and what we do, I mean, we're in it every day. And that's the other thing I would say. There's a lot of people that have a full-time job and will do loans here on the side because they think it's good money and whatnot. Never uh, works out. Does not work out. There's so many guidelines. People that have done you know, loans years ago. With the fallout of the market, uh, loans today and what loans were years ago, it's completely different. And so you want someone that's going to work with you that's in it, in the trenches every day. Um, I mean, just being away from it for a short period of time, you, you can get lost, and so... Everybody has a friend of a friend of a yeah, friend that's either a, mission a real estate agent or is in loans or, I mean, it, it's a, you know, and why are there all these different places? What's the difference between banks and brokerages and, and correspondence and direct? And all these things are what's important to understand because in... in it's not, it's not important just to work with the right loan officer. You need to make sure the right the loan officer is working for the right company as well. The setup thing is the best setup. So, and we have that. You know, we we have we've been around a long time and we we get it. We understand it. You know, we there there are very few things that you'd be able to throw at us that, that I'm not going to be able to know the answer of right off. Go ahead, ask me. <laughs> 
<laughs> you wouldn't know that. You wouldn't know that. You wouldn't know that. Thank you guys for coming to this. I'll let Cheryl and Chris finish up with what they're going to say, but we do have this. It's all falling apart, guys. <laughs> everybody for coming out today and, and obviously we're going to stay after a little bit. Get some more pizza. There's yeah. a lot of food left over. And you know, thanks, to, thanks to everybody that came. Jeff and Keith and Jason. And if you have any questions like our cards over there. there. Yeah. Contact information. Ask some questions. If you all know where to